This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. There is no better speaker uh, than Mini Sarwal to discuss gene expression, risk profiling, and applying these to personalized medicine in, uh, in transplantation. Mini? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, difficult to follow after, I think, Steve and Flavio's talk, and uh, after that standing ovation, I think I have to be brief uh, so that we can actually get to a glass of wine fairly quickly. So uh, the task that was given to me is to try and take some of the biomarker uh, kind of molecular work that we've been doing for the last uh, 15 years or so um, in my kind of uh, translational lab and see how we can apply it to improving outcomes, really actually bring it to the clinic, to the bedside. And I'm going to talk about some of the work in brief and then how we're encapsulating it at UCSF to actually start to change the way we stratify immune risk and then apply it towards perhaps perhaps improving outcomes uh, for our transplant recipients, not just in the short term, with an emphasis of really improving that in the long term. So uh, one of the things that we need to understand is to really try and personalize immunosuppression. We have to move away from just following the patient's serum creatinine, uh, perhaps doing a triggered biopsy, or perhaps doing a protocol biopsy, because I think it's important to really look at the overall immune risk assessment of the patient so that we can try and look at the yin and yang effect to try and really accurately map the risk for rejection as well as the risk of the burden of over immunosuppression. And the tools that lie before us today are really the serum creatinine, uh, which is a very inexpensive, very easy to measure tool, at which we are all very dependent on, and it's a great screening assay. But it is late, it is a redundant marker of injury, and it's really actually not specific uh, for actually autoimmune risk, since it goes up in various causes that could be completely uh, not immune related. Uh, and the biopsy, which at UCSF we do six-month protocol biopsies, and previously uh, where I was at Stanford at the pediatric program, we did five protocol biopsies, uh, essentially at 0, 3, 6, 12, and 24 months post-transplant. Uh, so they are good adjunct screening tools, but these are not the kind of uh, techniques that we can use uh, really in a regular manner, and they're all, all associated with the problem of being invasive, having uh, the associated morbidity of it being a procedure, and you really don't know when to actually do it. So you're doing guesswork by actually sticking a needle in your patient, and you're trying to do it at some early time post-transplantation to pick up that event. And as Dr. Vincenti showed, our six-month protocol biopsies are picking up completely stable creatinines with some evidence of inflammation in these graphs, which we're now trying to treat better. But what if we had done the biopsy at five months, or four months, or three months? Would we have actually got a different incidence? So this dependency from trying to stick the needle and get an event event is really picking up injury that is advanced and established. And the idea is, could you actually move that bar of diagnosis earlier? And so if you need to do this, one of the things is you have to step back and say is how would you better map the immune response? And this is actually a slide that's uh, borrowed from Alan Kirk from, a, I think, a review article he wrote some time ago. But you can see what we look at is really the trafficking of cells, um, basically that, that essentially go into secondary lymphoid organs where there's antigen presentation. They come in and they damage the graft. And then essentially what we want to try and harness is to try and understand this milieu of inflammation 
mutation that's happening in the graft, specific ideally to the immune process so that we can map acute rejection, map chronic rejection, but we would do it not just by sticking that needle into the organ, but we would look perhaps at the effluent that came out of the organ. So in lungs, it could be BAL, and we've done a lot of work emphasizing on looking at the urine. Uh, for today's talk, just because we are only encapsulated to a 30-minute talk, I'm not going to focus on all the work we've done on urine, but actually focus on looking at the peripheral blood. So how, what kind of information can we get if we just take a blood specimen from the patient? Is it a really tall order to say that it, that, that specimen of blood can be interrogated in a really specific manner so that we can now map what is actually happening in the organ? Not just map what is happening in the organ in a general inflammatory milieu, but can we actually map and come up with a correlate that would be quite accurate if you were to do a biopsy. So could you differentiate not just that if that immune risk process was acute rejection, chronic, drug toxicity, can you actually get to that level of granularity? So a very, very tall order. When we started doing this about 15, 16 years ago, we thought we would never get there because it seems to be like, it's like a needle in a haystack. I mean, we follow ESRs and CRPs to look for inflammation. Can we really get to that level of granularity that you can start to understand those differences and really correlate them with histology? So before I go into how we've do, do, uh, done that, really I just wanted to highlight a, 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 about two or three slides to really highlight why it is really important that the era for personalization of immunosuppression is here. And we really need to all probably be on that bandwagon because there are many reasons that personalize, personalization of immunosuppression makes total sense for the transplant recipient, not just for the quality of the life of the organ, but also really for the recipient themselves. We know that one size does not fit all. So this is actually uh, histological scores coming from the serial protocol biopsies that were done in the SNS-01 multicenter randomized trial that was funded by the NIH. 120 pediatric recipients were enrolled with steroid-free and steroid avoidance protocols. And we found that, in fact, there was no difference in the accrual of subclinical injury that occurred in these organs when we did five protocol biopsies in the first two years post-transplant. This is looking at a subset of those patients who never had an episode of acute rejection in the course of that two-year follow-up. It is actually quite amazing to see that in these children whose creatinines look really stable, the biggest impact of what drives chronic injury in all these different compartments, and this is basically the different compartments for tubular interstitial fibrosis, for tubular atrophy, uh, for hyalinosis, um, and I, I apologize, actually the scores are, have, have gone under the text box, but regardless, if you look at all of these accrual of chronicity changes within the allograft, the biggest impact is time. Nothing else actually drove this accrual of chronicity. Not even the absence of acute rejection could you actually see this. So I think one thing became clear that non-immune injury to the grafts from drugs in protocol biopsies without acute rejection is there. We just don't map all our patients that frequently to see it. But if you were to do it in the course of a randomized trial, you actually see that this is a startling finding. We also found that drug toxicity scoring on three-month protocol biopsies, if you developed a quantitative score, and this was published by Kambu et al. in, um, um, in uh, C. Jason in 2007, we found that those scores actually correlate with 12-month graph function. So you can start seeing changes as early as a three-month protocol biopsy, even histologically, that should tell you that you shouldn't be probably using these drugs to that extent in that patient. But of course, we don't biopsy everybody at three months. And then we see that drug-related chronic graft injury, we know from the studies by Nankival et al. in the New England Journal and subsequent studies, also by Meyer Kreisch, have shown that drug-related chronic graft injury does limit graft survival. The second benefit of personalizing immunosuppression is to avoid the dangers of over-immunosuppression. And basically, we know that even though we are having an improvement in the reduction of clinical acute rejection incidence in most centers, and at UCSF, I know they were probably under 10% for clinical acute rejection, the bigger problem, if you look at USRDS, um, if you look at other databases, is the problem of increasing infection. So we know that lifelong immunosuppression increases infection, and probably a 200 
fall increase in malignancy risk if you actually look at the pen registry. And there is a rising problem of BK as well as herpes viremia. And this basically data just shows that if you look at graft function in people who have subclinical viremia, so these are not people who develop CMV disease, EBV disease, PTLD, but if you were to monitor them serially and their viral loads increased at a subclinical level, it actually can impact graft function. And you can see the, essentially the, uh, these curves are lower if you were positive for both. And you can also see in longer follow-up, you may actually start to impact graft survival. So I think what I'd like to put to you is that it's clear that we should be trying to manage our patients individually, but that would require us to create curves like this. A curve where you actually take the immune risk of the patient, it, and you would assume that most of your patients would have this kind of bell-shaped curve, where you find that most of the immu transplant immunosuppression protocols that you give to these patients uh, put them somewhere here, because we're doing pretty well overall with clinical acute rejection being really low, and their creatinines being stable over time and graph survival rates being really good. So we're getting most of it right, and they lie here. But you can see that with environmental stimuli, with other events, with perhaps non-adherence, their immune risk kind of threshold will yo-yo, so they will move somewhere to the left or right in this kind of bar. But there is a percentage of patients who clearly are at very low risk, and there is a percentage of patients who are at higher risk. So this would be somewhere around that 10% uh, in, a, in a program like UCSF, and this is kind of really an unknown number because we really don't know what that is. So if we could map the immune response better, we could really find out which patients we could reduce immunosuppression on, which patients we could increase immunosuppression proactively on, and really get it right for these patients. And if we could map that, we could then look at the drugs that those patients are on and start to reduce them to the immune risk to really limit morbidity to the graft, morbidity to the patient. And Dr. Tamlanovich's talk was really outlined all the morbi morbid side effects that all these drugs called to the cardiovascular kind of burden of these patients. So I'd like to take you through two stages to see, could we actually understand the ends of the spectrum such that we can treat our patients better? So the first is there is a condition that we know that exists in humans, and it is called spontaneous or operational tolerance. Most individuals, and we see this, of course, most with adolescents, if you play with your meds, you reduce your meds, you actually have an acute rejection episode. Very rarely, and we don't know what that percentage truly is in the human population, we see it in kidneys, there are anecdotal results in hearts and lungs, and we see it, in fact, a lot more in liver. But liver could be, of course, an organ with different regenerative capacity. So let's come back to the kidney. If you actually look at the kidney, there are people with HLA mismatched allografts who, for whatever reason, have decided they don't like to take their meds, and quietly, without telling their physicians, one drug at a time, they've been playing with their meds, reducing them, and there is a small percentage of them who actually have an HLA mismatched uh, allograft no active infections or cancers, and they maintain that allograft without having any rejection episode. So this is a condition that we call operational tolerance. And some around about 12 years ago, I was actually visiting Jean-Paul Solilou and giving a talk in NOT, and he turned around and he said, you know, many are working on all these studies looking at rejection profiles. I have these five patients in NOT who are HLA mismatched, who've been off immunosuppression for eight or nine years. Do you think we could find something in blood? And we were like, oh, no, I, I doubt it. So we started this as a little exercise but I think we've been now working on it, and so has the ITN recently, so has the RISET group in the UK, and now we've understood that we can take blood samples from these patients and actually learn what is happening to a subset of genes that's driving immune quiescence. But more importantly, if we could understand and learn from these patients, could we use that information to start monitoring our patients who are on one drug, two drug, three drug, and try and sort them into the people at low immune risk and high immune risk, such that you can start to manipulate immunosuppression proactively. So that was the kind of aim which led us to start these studies. So to try and map this, we basically set out on a really multi-center hunt for these patients. And we probably have the largest group of patients that have been mapped by these kind of high-throughput expression studies. We did this by taking blood from these patients and profiling them on microarrays. And essentially, uh, they had to meet that kind of criteria for what is transplantation tolerance. And very important to actually define that we use these kind of criteria to try and find these patients. 
patients. So these were long-term stable graft function patients without an immunosuppression, and the cutoff was they had to be off drug for at least two years. And in fact, this is the average time. 8.8 .8, uh, years was the mean time. Dr. Starzl actually sent a patient who was off all meds for 40 years, and in fact remains off meds for 40 years. So causes of immunosuppression withdrawal in these patients. Uh, in the rare instance was it when the physician was involved because they had some drug toxicity and the physician deliberately uh, minimized meds, and in a few cases the patient had PTLD. So when we initially first profiled the patients, we wanted to make sure when they entered this kind of study that they were well from complete resolution of PTLD. So they didn't, we didn't have confounding effects of malignancy on the bl uh, peripheral blood profiling. But the majority of patients in this uh, cohort were actually pe people who actually stopped taking their meds. And to date, we have about 42 patients that have actually been profiled who meet this criteria. Interestingly, these patients all had the same history. They were all HLA mismatched. Their mean HLA mismatch in our cohort is about 3.1. But interestingly, they all stopped their drugs one drug at a time, and it was done very slowly. They all had that same history. Whether the choice was with the CNI first or the steroid first, that differed. And when we uh, collected these patients for profiling, we also didn't want any of these patients to have been suffering from any recent infections, be uh, free from malignancy for greater than five years, and we basically assessed their immune competence by looking at their responses to flu vaccination. Importantly, again, what we understand the immune response to be may not be the entire picture, because 20% of these patients had actually had an early acute rejection episode. And yet, when we are taught about how to manage immune risk, I remember when I'm rounding and when we were residents, we were taught that if a patient had had an acute rejection episode, they're in the kind of higher risk category. And we kind of keep them on that higher risk category all the time. But I think the important take home message is that the immune response is metastable, and it changes over time in response to environmental as well as innate immune kind of drivers that perhaps drive homeostatic proliferation of various regulatory and, and cytotoxic cells. And so it's very important to understand that just because your immune response in a patient today looks like X, many years later it actually may be Y. So your patient may not just sit in one category for life. And so to do this, this is kind of in a nutshell, over the last 15 years, we first published that indeed we could find differences in genes, in peripheral blood, when we started to profile them using high-density microarrays, looking at 40,000 human genes, and then doing a lot of bioinformatics to sift this down to really the ones that were most associative. And then more recently, just um, uh, this year, we published that in fact you can now reduce this down to a three-gene panel, which has actually been run across multitudes of patients to try and refine the predictive nature of these panels for immune quiescence. And so you can see that when you start looking at these genes and um, you actually start to cluster these patients, so on the right are patients who are operationally tolerant, on the left are people who are non-tolerant, so these are the kind of heat maps that come out of these studies. So the red is the expression of the gene, the green is the expression of the gene. In this comparative uh, finding, red means increased expression, green means decreased expression, and you can see the dendrogram on the top shows the degree of relatedness of the samples to the profiles of all those genes that we are sampling. So you can see that there are two big arms. So that means there is a lot of difference between the tolerant and the non-tolerant people across this subset of genes. And from here, we have actually taken three of them and modeled them across various groups to come up with an algorithm that allows us to create a score for immune quiescence. And this is essentially what we did when we actually took about 150 patients who were with stable grafts on maintenance immunosuppression but using different induction protocols, and we profiled them in the first year post-transplant. You can see that most of the people that we profiled actually did not have this signature for immune quiescence, which makes sense because we don't think it is such a common finding. So the score, the modeling score for the three genes basically in this algorithm shows you a cutoff of about 60%. So on the y-axis is the percent probability of the patient having a score for immune quiescence. And if it is greater than 60%, then that's actually a very high risk call that you are basically are more likely to have this operationally tolerant similar signature. And the way these cutoffs were set is by mapping them back on independent sets of operationally tolerant people to see if we could classify them correctly. So if you just look at the extreme 
right, you can see that there is a very small subset of patients in this who did have pretty high scores for these three genes for immune quiescence. They very strongly overlapped all these gene signatures with the people who were operationally tolerant. Now remember, the people who are tolerant are on no drug. These people are on drug, but they still have matching gene scores that look so similar. And it looks like at least in the early days, and these numbers, of course, are not as large for us to have any statistical significance, whether induction makes a difference to your incidence of operational tolerance. But you can see that in the Bladacept uh, people who were profiled, out of the 59, five of them actually had very high scores. Uh, but you can see also in the CAMPATH group, out of the 33 that were profiled, four had very high scores. So perhaps there is a is an opportunity to try and use these scores to also look at induction protocols that may skew people towards a greater incidence of immune quiescence. But as I said, these are just early clues, and we have to apply this towards, uh, I think, larger patient cohorts to really validate this data. So one idea was to try and look at gene profiles that map the quiescent side. The other side was the other side of that bell-shaped curve, is to ask if we could map essentially genes that could map uh, patients who had a higher risk of rejection. Uh, so for this, we've actually collected very carefully annotated blood samples matched with biopsy samples. The biopsy samples have been centrally scored by pathologists as part of multicenter clinical trials, and that have provided us essentially BAMF scores that provide definite histologically graded acute rejection, and then we profile those blood samples. So to show you the other side, uh, just to show that this has been work that's been going on for at least the last 16 to 17 years, we've gone through microarray-based discovery. We've gone through training and diagnostic development using gene sets. We first shrunk this down from 40,000 to 500 genes. These went through high fluidic uh, PCR validation across independent cohorts. Uh, we first did a pediatric independent and validation. Uh, we found a set of genes that actually performed really well. This was a set of 10 genes. The, those models were actually locked and applied in an NIH multicenter randomized trial, the SNS01 trial. Uh, the uh, PCRs were performed blindly. The data was uploaded to the NIH uh, uh, statisticians at Rho and PPD. Um, they then ran the correlation, and the data was quite startling. It showed that actually your sensitivity and specificity for these genes to pick up uh, rejection in a blood sample when you knew what the diagnosis was by biopsy in this randomized trial uh, produced um, uh, levels that were uh, well into the 90%, which suggests that you have an assay that gives you uh, sensitivity and specificity of 90% confidence that you could, with a blood sample, in fact, at the time of the event, tell what was happening with the event. And this was specific for acute rejection and was not confounded by BK viral nephritis which is important for us, and sometimes that's a confounder, not just in the pathology, is also how to treat the patients. It was also not confounded by chronic allograft nephropathy or other graft injuries that may cause graft dysfunction. We've then gone on to do adult validation and then basically taken the genes to combine it both across adult and pediatric cohorts. And uh, an assay that we've developed across 17 genes is called the Kidney Solid Organ Response Test. We, the acronym for this is KSORT. Uh, it's very exciting for us because we've been able to develop this assay, validate it multiple times, and then now bring it to a clinical lab where it can be available. And so this is the most recent paper that came out of this. Um, in PLOS Medicine, recently published. Um, you can see there are 558 blood samples, all matched with biopsies that went into this analysis. Uh, data came from eight programs. This was the final validation stage. This is from US, EU, and Mexico. And the names on there you will recognize are some of the main KOLs in the transplant field who actually contributed patients to this study. And you can see in this independent validation set, um, we basically had this kind of data. So this is the, the one of the the figures from the paper. This shows you from CPMC just up the road, uh, Emory, UPMC, and UCLA. UPMC is University of Pittsburgh. Um, you can see if you had blood samples given from patients with rejection, that's in, uh, in red, without rejection in green. You can see that the gene scores, again, based on the percent probability on the y-axis, the, uh, the uh, model threshold is 50% in this case. You can see significantly higher thresholds for acute rejection versus no rejection. Again, when you see you take this into AUC curves, 
these are actually, um, I think it's uh, very, uh, uh, you know, very exciting to see that we can take uh, a blood sample and come up with this level of accuracy. And so what we've done is to get this ready to be able to use and something that physicians can use and try and understand is to compute this into a risk score because it's not sufficient to just perhaps have a percent and somebody to make sense of what that percent may mean. So we've done a lot of biostatistical modeling and customized algorithms have been written so that you can take a blood sample, do a, do a PCR, it goes into the machine, it comes up with an algorithm score and it produces a risk score for rejection. And and in this, what we have done across the 17 genes, we do modeling across, the, there are 13 models that actually get developed, and each model has to call the sample rejection. So if it does, you get a one. If it does, you get a two. If it does, you get a three, and you need to do this 13 times. So in this modeling, if nine out of the 13 models or greater call the sample as rejection, you actually get a high risk. If nine out of the 13 models call the sample as no rejection, then you get a low risk, and anywhere in between, is an intermediate call. And I think it was very important to develop the algorithm so that it produced black, white, and gray as calls. Because if you look at also the genomic health data where, is a, where you have breast cancer risk uh, and it's a commercially available assay, uh, they have an intermediate call rate of about 25 to 28% where you don't know what the assay gives. And the more we looked at the data, it is very important for us to understand that everything is not black and white. Even though those AUCs are good, we need to have the the area of grayness where perhaps the sample has to be repeated. So when we did this, and because we've uh, now profiled over a 1,000 samples, these thresholds were set so that about 15% of the time you can get an intermediate call when you do the assay, but most of the time you will get a definite call of either a high risk or a low risk. And this is kind of another figure from the paper that shows that you actually have very good prediction rates when you take a biopsy which has an event of either acute rejection or some other pathology or stable, and you actually profile it across the assay, you can actually get a very good separation just based on the gene sets. And again, those were the AUCs. So I think more importantly, yes, it's great to be able to tell at the time of biopsy, but if you step back and I want to profile and predict how my patients are going to do, I would like, really like to move that diagnosis earlier. So can these assays start to tell you well before the creatinine moves, in fact, that my patient is destined to, uh, to perhaps have a histologically confirmed acute rejection? And you can see that if you were to profile these patients, I'm trying to get the mouse here. So if you actually profile these patients and you can see these are the scores, even like about three to seven months before, uh, before the rejection episode. At zero is the rejection episode where you have the score. You can see the score is almost the same level about three months before you were going to have the rejection episode. And it's starting to rise even about six months before. So importantly, that three months before time point, the creatinines were all normal. So the only way you would have been able to tell is perhaps put a needle into the graft and picked up that subclinical inflammation, or if the histological changes had not yet occurred, you may not even have picked it up. So to be able to do an assay that maybe tells you that your patient is destined perhaps to have an increased immune activation profile such that they may develop a rejection episode then becomes really important. And actually, more importantly, when we actually uh, treat these patients and intensify immunosuppression, you can see that uh, possibly you can use these to also follow resolution of rejection because you can and see the scores start to fall. So I just wanted to end by saying it's great that we've been able to develop these kind of, this kind of uh, molecular and intellectual equity for these gene sets around these low and high kind of risk of rejection such that we can use them to manipulate immunosuppression. Uh, are we bringing this in to really change the way we are treating patients at UCSF? And I just wanted to share some of the exciting trials. Flavio actually has already talked to you about this first trial, um, and I think this is a slide made by Tong where she's also put the, the players at the bottom who are actually taking part in this UO1 study. But I think the interesting thing is in this trial that Dr. Vincenti uh, 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 presented about where Tregs are being given to these patients, you can see we are using some of these biomarkers to actually monitor not just resolution of inflammation by histology, not just increase infiltration of Tregs within the graft and to map their longevity, but to also look at persistent resolution of molecular inflammation and parameters, and so we have various assays that we're actually using to uh, monitor these patients.
Uh, interestingly, we're also uh, just going to start a study where, as you've heard, we're doing a lot of highly sensitized patients right now are coming up to transplant because of the changes in uh, really organ allocation policies. And because of that, we also want to see if we can use this assay to start to serially monitor our patients such that we would be able to predict and trigger which patients in future would either need an earlier rejection uh, biopsy or which people would actually need to be treated with more intensified immunosuppression because they had a higher risk score for K-sort. And most excitingly, again, I think Dr. Vincenti has, uh, has presented some of this data, and we've seen the exciting data with Bilatacept. But uh, at UCSF, as well as four other centers that will be joining us, we actually have patients who are on long-term Bilatacept treatment uh, with cortico corticosteroids and Celsept. And again, going back to the fact that do you really need three drugs, or do you need two, or do you need one? And to ask that question, we are actually going to take these patients, um, we are actually going to profile them with both the rejection assay and the tolerance assay, and essentially we're going to profile them to see if the K-sort assay is negative, and if their tolerance assay either is negative or positive, we will actually uh, take off the corticosteroid and get them onto Celsept. And the idea is what you want to eventually do is have a K-sort assay that is negative and a tolerance assay that becomes positive. And those are the patients that we would want to select to actually get onto Bilatacept monotherapy. And the ones that perhaps then show a persistence of the tolerance or the immune quiescence assay to be positive will be the ones that will be spaced from Q four to Q8 Bilatacept. So this will be a new era of really personalizing immunosuppression where you can select the patients who need to receive perhaps these kind of targeted, low morbidity, high kind of uh, supporting the functional uh, kind of performance of that allograft, but really select the right patients to give those right drugs to because these are expensive drugs and insurance is not going to support us to just do these trials in everybody and then, and then just expose them to random risk. So I just want to end by saying that really I think the future is here. I think the tools are coming in play. Evolved monitoring for transplant care I think is here. Um, and we've used these kind of application of these high throughput technologies. I've just run through some of this to show that these can result in very sensitive and specific novel gene sets for peripheral, very important, not tissue-based, non-invasive monitoring, but for both rejection and tolerance. It's important that you can reduce these to QPCR assays that have a quick turnaround time, so you can get a result back within four hours. So these can be relatively cheap. They can be eventually situated in your local lab in the hospital. Initially, they have to go out through core labs, but eventually the idea would be is to get them into the local labs. And then the day will come when immunosuppression will be dosed really to immune threshold and risk, and we will face patients with reduced uh, risk of um, infections and cancer, reduced graft toxicity. We will be able to really proactively actively treat subclinical rejection, and I think that's when we will start to see that extension in, uh, in graft life expectancies. Just wanted to end by saying that a lot of the work has been done by members in, the, in, our, in my lab. Nathan has written actually all the algorithms for KSORT, and Sue, who's been with me for 17 years, has actually processed every uh, sample that I've actually shown over here, and then really all of the in investigators, the patients and their families, without which none of this work would have been possible, as well as funding from um, the different institutions at the NIH as well as industry. Thank you so much. Yes. Those genes who, which are overexpressed prior to or the time of the function projection, have they become downregulated after the treatment of the treatment? Yeah, so the question is that the genes that were increased at the time of acute rejection, when we treat, do they go down? Um, so yes, we do see that. In fact, we see that for individual genes, but we also see it for the composite score. So where I had shown the kind of graph over time, um, when we actually intensify immunosuppression for whatever the physician chooses, the intent to treat, uh, you do see a fall in scores. But the fall in the scores is not seen in everybody at the same level. So one of the things that we are also interested in exploring is perhaps uh, whether these gene sets and these scores can be used to monitor for steroid-resistant rejection and steroid-sensitive rejection, or treatment-resistant and treatment-sensitive rejection. But generally, there is a decrement in scores. 
Yes, these are all histologically proven rejections. And in fact, in most of the, of the rejections that we have, we have a follow-up biopsy that's done at about four to six weeks after treatment. So we actually, in a bunch of people where the scores didn't fall at that great a rate, there is actually a strong correlation with persisting residual tubulitis. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the question was, would the risk profiles change over time when a patient went to monotherapy? Um, so I think I didn't maybe highlight that sufficiently, but the immune profile and the immune kind of uh, whatever we're mapping here is a completely metastable state. It does change over time. So just because your patient gets successfully onto monotherapy doesn't mean he's safe for life and you can say, bye, just stay on this drug forever. I think they continue to need to be monitored because um, one of the things we found is in the operationally tolerant state Study, we had a French patient who actually was off all drug for eight years, took part in the study. When we actually profiled him, he had a strong signature for tolerance. That patient went out and got a tattoo. The tattoo got infected. Uh, secondary to the infected tattoo, the patient came in a few weeks later and had a fulminant rejection episode, lost the graft. So it is, it is uh, important to recognize that the innate immunity and alloimmunity and heterologous immunity have a complex interplay that it's not sufficient to say that just because you've reached this state of metastable, whatever, immune quiescence, that you're going to be safe and don't require to be followed up. Yes. So whenever these tests are readily available, are you thinking about testing the patient immediately after and then every three or six months or so, and then see how it changes and how can you change the therapy at the same time? Absolutely, so the question is what is the frequency of monitoring that you would think for these assays? So the k -sort assay, yes, is available at a restricted, um, I mean, at, at, at a kind of core lab. Uh, and I think the, the recommendation is because we find that the window of being able to predict histological rejection uh, seems to be about three months. We are being able to get to that point. So the recommendation really would be is to get a first sample prior to the patient going home, so maybe a day five, six, seven when, uh, prior to discharge, and then to follow that patient Q3 monthly for that first year. So you should be able to capture a window where you can see a triggered event, hopefully, because you're within that three-month window. Well, life is not perfect, and maybe somebody stops taking their meds you know, seven days before and has a fulminant rejection episode. Those things may still happen. But overall, if you are happy having an increased immune activation profile, you should be able to pick it up within that three-month window. So the recommendation is to probably monitor Q3 monthly, three to four monthly. And how do they correlate with something that is readily available, like a CRP? CRP? Or ESR, so if you, we are beginning to have programs, like for example, we have Yes. And uh, we know the, CR, the baseline CRP for these patients, and then it begins to go off. So then we can apply these ones and know what is the risk for a rejection. Would that be possible? So the question is like, should how does this correlate to CRP and ESR? Um, we haven't done any head-to-head -head comparison of these assays with CRP and ESR, but in the multicenter randomized trials where these parameters were captured, um, the CRP and ESR do not have the same level of sensitivity and specificity. I think they may be general markers of perhaps inflammation, but they have not um, ever shown, at least in the trials that we've done or where we've looked at some of this data. Um, so we have never done it as a head-to-head -head analysis with this, uh, this kind of assay. Yes. Can you, so the question is, can you keep an immune quiescent state? Yeah, that's, um, that's a great question. I mean, I think that's what we all want to achieve. Um, yeah, well, uh, I think it is, a, it is a baby step in that direction because if you have a measurement of it or a map of it and you know your patient is in that state, I think that will be the first step for us as a community to learn why is that patient in that privileged state. So one of the things we found in our study is that in addition to this particular gene kind of profile that we see in blood, uh, the there is an expansion of myeloid-derived dendritic cells 
cells. They look like myeloid-derived dendritic cells because of their gating. It's possible that they're a new cell population that we don't fully understand, but they fit the gate of the myeloid-derived dendritic cell when we do the flow. Uh, there is also an expansion of naive and transitional B cells, but not consistently across these patients. So I think there are other, other mechanisms that we may start to understand and uncover, but having a tool to at least say that you are different from this other patient, I think would be a first step, because you could go back and perhaps if that's the patient who had CMV replication subclinically, or that's the patient who was showing hyalinosis on their biopsies, then those are the patients you want to perhaps go back and say that you probably don't need to be on three drug, you could get onto two drug and maybe eliminate something. Yes. Right. So the question is, is the, uh, do the operationally tolerant patients have less inflammatory events, and do their grafts maybe show less inflammation? So uh, to a man, every operationally tolerant patient that we approach refused to be biopsied. So they all said they did not want us to come close to them. And I kind of, you know, I think we all understand that they kind of just wanted to be lost. So the first thing was to try and bring them and say that, no, we want to study you, but so we do not have um, information on the graft. And uh, we have it actually on two of those 42 patients where the graft looked quiet, but I don't think really we can say we have that kind of information. The suggestion is that it would be very quiet. Uh, we've actually done mitochondrial gene analysis on these patients, and we show basically complete quiescence. So whatever is happening, we expect that those grafts will be fine. Um, these patients are they look normal. It's not like they've had recent infections or they're immunocompromised or uh, they've had can oh, increased incidence of cancers. So whatever the homeostatic kind of mechanism is in this state maintains intact uh, responses, uh, innate immune responses. So they can respond normally to vaccinations and they can respond. So it looks like it's a very uh, donor-specific ignorance that is developed, uh, which, of course, as, as we've seen anecdotally, can break if you actually upset that homeostatic kind of uh, whatever that state is that allows them to ignore donor but recognize third party. Thank you.